when I left college for the second time, I was a slow learner. <laughs> I realized I needed to have a trade, and I wanted a really classical trade, um, a real four-year apprenticeship, and I did that. And I did that in trade printing, which I really loved. I liked the idea of uh, being a part of disseminating information. We don't need it now, we have printers on our desk, but back then, if you ran a press, it's kind of a position of power, I like that. But, you know, when I decided to accept this invitation, looking back at my crooked little path, I saw there were a lot of changes midstream, kind of all the time. And so sure enough, as I ended that four-year apprenticeship, I had gotten a little uh, disenchanted with printing thousands of pieces of paper. I think that resonates with us now even more than then. But on the way, I discovered there was a different kind of printing I could do. And that was limited edition um, art printing. And that was working with artists. And so I kind of stepped over into that field. And for 10 years, that was my art school, working with world-class artists, helping them make etchings, printing at most 50 or 60 sheets of paper at a time. I loved it. It was a chance to see a different version of success. And I'm not talking about the money, I'm talking about the experience of watching people's creative process. It was really informative to me. Then somewhere near the end of that, a printing friend of mine who was teaching high school um, took a sabbatical, asked me to cover. And never having taught a day in my life before, I said, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try. Uh, we sat down, we made a plan. Every day, here's what you do, every day. And so, sure enough, I start out the very first day, midway through the first class period. Blank faces, students, not happening. I, was like, I realized it was her plan, not my plan. And what I did actually started me on my teaching career. I threw that plan out the window, and I started working with the kids like they were artists, one on one. And over the course of 14 years teaching at the Urban School in San Francisco, I became really fascinated, both with the age group, high school students, and the idea and the impact that art had on their experience there. So I was very happily doing that. It had been a transformation for me to become a teacher and feel like I really had some idea of what I was doing. Midway in there, I got a fellowship, took my family to New York, and um, I had a real change in my teaching there. But I'll come to that a little bit later. Back at Urban, arts philanthropist Ann Hatch decided she wanted to start a school with art at the center. And she got Margaret and um, Robert Mondavi to join her, and they created the Oxville School. And what you're going to see in my presentation is um, scenes from that school, vignettes of what we do there. But really, I just want to capture the specific moments of change that can really transform a student's life. I have a strong feeling that we infantilize students in our culture. High school age students in most other parts of the world have a lot of the responsibilities of adults, and we're keeping them kind of in this cocoon and really denying them the chance to show us what they know and what they can do. So this picture from our garden, so yeah, it, they're saying, they're screaming to us, let us, let us think big. Let us actively engage the world. Let us work collaboratively and not competitively. So as I began thinking about how we could do this better, uh, this chance to start a school, I realized I could make a different kind of school. And we could go about redefining success for these kids. Instead of a narrow kind of approach to success, we needed to open up, open it up to different kind of learners. Help kids learn what kind of a learner they were so they could reconfigure their knowledge and use it in different ways. We needed to get out from under what someone said, you know, the really blunt instrument of standardized testing, which measures kind of irrelevant skills. I thought back to my own high school experience, where I also had a break midstream. I did a year of public high school, but then I went to a boarding school back east, and it was an eye-opener. But there, I really received a set of skills that I carried for in my life. It was the same set of skills that enabled me to leave college when I had a better idea of what I wanted to do. But what we wanted to do with this new school is bring a diverse body of students from all over the country and internationally and immerse them in a studio art practice program 
where we taught everything through the lens of art. That's English, science, history, math. Everything was taught through the lens of art, inviting uh, real live artists to be there in the studios working with the kids. Art as a different way of knowing the world. Art as a different way of organizing your experience. One of the chief aspects of our program is what I call co-learning. We're learning with the kids. It's a different teacher-student relationship. They're excited, we're excited. I had a moment, an epiphany around this, when I realized that, why am I so stingy with my knowledge? Why am I just making the assumption that they know nothing and I need to lead them from step one forward? And I realized, yeah, I can do the research. I can know what all the available resources are. But then the first thing I should do, I should ask them what they already know, what they already know about the subject. Then I know what I have to correct. We have a better uh, point of entry. More of them will be engaged with the initial discussion. And the class will take off. One of my mentors told me in my early days of teaching that the best way to start a class is not with a lesson plan, but with a really good question. And you watch the kids take that question and run with it. Now, another way of looking at success in this format is, what about your teachers? Well, when my painting teacher says, you know what, I really want to learn gardening and joins the gardening activity, that's an illustration and a powerful model for kids about lifelong learning. Here is someone who is accomplished. They teach me painting, but also now we're in here and we're learning in this new environment together. They can see how I problem solve and what I bring to it. We flip the tables on evaluation. We didn't just give them a letter grade and rank and sort them. Instead, we had a narrative assessment where we actually had to consider each kid and think about their strengths and think about not deficits, they're too young for deficits, but areas for growth. And this is where we focused our pedagogy. We looked at it in three large areas. So the first is the practice of inquiry. How do you do research? How do you find information? And having found it, how do you validate it? How do you prove that it's true? And then the process of engagement, working with materials. And whether the materials are words in your research paper or actually the studio art materials, really, are you engaging it? Are you facing the unknown? Are you really looking forward in what you might be doing, something you haven't done before? And then finally, presentation, the presentation, the finished product. How are you communicating what you know? And we do something along the lines of portfolio assessment, where they're going to write a research paper, 10 to 12 pages deep. They're going to create a work or a body of work. And then they're going to do a formal oral presentation about that work. It knocks people out when they come and see the kind of topics the kids will choose and their ability to really speak um, with great knowledge about it. So this is an example of a student-centered program. One of the first things we want to do is just to validate their lived experience. They are the experts in their own lives. We want them to bring that experience forward as they encounter new information out in the world. So what we do is we talk about um, working from micro to macro, working from an idea in the world back down into the micro of their lives. So it's not a question of merely memorizing names and dates. It's through the dy similar dynamics in your own life, you have a better understanding of why these movements happen, what social change is about, the shape of history, really, when you think about it that way. This makes them more open to learning new information, but it also enables them to embrace the unknown in ways they may have been a little fearful of before. On the way to this, you know, they're just, they're so plugged in these days in every way. This generation, is flooded with information. But how can they use that? How can they take that? How can they filter that? And it's when you bring an idea to a material and when the material pushes back, you have to change your idea. And maybe you see new insights about it. Maybe it's a happy accident that opens a whole new horizon for you. And this is, the kind, this is an example of the kind of flexible thinking that we need our new leaders to be doing for the unforeseen challenges that they're going to be facing. We don't want them writing code. We want them painting code. 
We want them approaching it in a completely new way. We want them to really encounter pushback, resistance, and more importantly, failure. Failure in a supportive environment. Too many kids today think failure is the end of the world. I'm dead, I'm going to die, no future. When really, the bigger lesson is learning how to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and really take another approach. To be given the opportunity to do that and validate what they've just learned in that is all important. Always, we're teaching for a future we cannot imagine. We don't know what's going to be out there. When I came through, there was the goal. And you could take the traditional approach or you could take the alternative approach, come in the back door. There's no goal anymore. The goal is ever changing. What is the skill set they need to always be able to achieve that goal, to reach that goal? What kind of skills do we need to give them to make that happen? And then, what does success look like? Success is a feeling of empowerment that you're confident that you can take on challenges even if you haven't been there before. The kids coming to our program, it's like the first day of college. They're not in neighborhood school. The first thing that explodes is what's normal. Someone looks like me, we like the same music, but they're a Republican and I'm a Democrat. Or they're faithful and I'm not. And all of a sudden, you're living in a close community where you really have to deal with that. Part of the empowerment comes that you survive this very intense social and academic challenge. I say to them when they arrive that you've just done the best thing you could do at this point in your life, which is to step into the unknown. And because you can do it at this age, you will be able to do it again and again in your life, perhaps when the stakes are even higher. So, it's been very interesting to me to see that empowerment, having done something very challenging without the support of friends and family, owning your power now, and knowing you're ready to move into the world. So, one of my alums is now on my board, and I asked her this question, what does success look like to you? And she said, you know, one of the most important things is that uh, when I arrived, that my idea of success was extrinsic of somebody else's challenges and somebody else's assessment. She said, leaving here, it's now intrinsic. I know it's my opinion that matters the most, my choices, and my definition of success. A couple of summers ago, an alum came back with her dad. She wanted to show a friend around the campus. And while she was out showing the friend around, the dad got me and said, you know, my daughter came back from your program addicted. And this is the last thing a boarding school educator wants to hear. <laughs> but he said, no, she came back addicted to learning. She'd been a middling student in a regional high school, Sierra Foothills. Everybody knew she was smart, but she was unengaged. When she came back, second semester, junior year, and on, she made 4.0. Because now she knew she wanted to learn. She wanted to challenge the adults in her life. She wanted to get new information and move her life ahead. So if there's one thing I can say to you, for parents, mentors, is to set aside your assumptions, set aside your regrets, and be able to see your kids, see them for who they are, and to put the right set of choices in front of them so they can be the people that they want to be. Thank you.